Okay, that brings me to the mission that we've heard about a little bit, and I'll try and cover everything that there is to know about Rosetta, or at least that I know as the European Space Agency project scientist for Rosetta. I will try and briefly go over why we're there, why we go, why we're interested in these things, and then go specifically into Rosetta, the target comet, and uh, give you an update of where we are now. <coughs> it's widely believed that the solar system began through a collapse of a load of dust and gas. Uh, that's from where we got the sun, and the subsequent disk of debris collected itself up into the planets and moons, but the leftover bits are still around. We think of those as the small bodies of the solar system, and they, I'll classify them in two parts here. We have the asteroid belt, which is found just between Mars and Ju uh, Jupiter's orbit, around three to five astronomical units. That's a, a measurement of the Earth to the Sun. It's a convenient way of measuring things. So these are these rocky objects in that uh, belt. And then further out still, we find the Kuiper belt, which is this disk at the outskirts of the solar system. And even further than that is a big cloud that surrounds the system and actually spreads out to about a, uh, a quarter of the way to the nearest uh, solar system. It's about a, a light year out. And that's the Oort cloud. Now, these, this is the reservoir of the comets. That's where the comets come from. Every so often, they're perturbed and brought into the inner solar system. We get to see them. Um, this is a comet. This is Hal Bopp. Uh, actually, I'm using the picture of the nucleus from uh, Halley's Comet. But this is the common uh, nomenclature of, uh, of, of, of a comet's makeup. We have the comb in the outer atmosphere, a dust tail, so all the bits of dust that are coming off the comet uh, form that dust tail, and there's also gas being sublimated, being uh, released from the comet. So instead of going from uh, a solid liquid to gas, because of the pressures involved in space, you go directly to a gas. That's what sublimation is. We get this gas tail. It interacts with the, the sun's radiation and also the outer atmosphere of the sun, the plasma, and you get this plasma tail as well. And inside all of this is a tiny little nucleus. Over the years, we've made observations. Um, this is some Chinese silk observations. This is also uh, with allusion to uh, kind of uh, trans-channel interactions. Uh, this is from the uh, Bayer Tapestry, and written on the top there is they marvel at the star. And actually, this is Halley's Comet that was observed. And it was usually a sign of foreboding, although depending on which side of the channel you were at this time was whether it was a good luck charm or a bad luck charm. It was pretty bad for this guy over here. Um, here's a Babylonian tablet, which actually, you can't pick it out. I can't, because I don't speak Babylonian. Uh, there's actually mention of Halley's Comet there. But this is just back calculated from when we know, or we're quite certain of uh, where Halley was, or Halley's Comet was uh, back in time. And it comes up quite a lot. More modern observations, this is from the SOHO satellite, looking at sun grazing comets. So you see it going in and, uh, being just, and not, not making it around the sun, basically. It broke up and didn't make it to the other side or just fell apart. It had nothing to do with that explosion on the other side. This is an image from um, the Solar Dynamic Observatory. I'm not sure if you can pick it up. There's this little wisp moving across the surface there. The tail's being broken up and interacting with the outer atmosphere of the sun, the magnetic fields that are coming off the sun. Then we jump back a little bit to the 80s. Um, Ian mentioned this before. Um, Halley's Comet, we had Giotto, the Giotto spacecraft. Here, there was a flotilla of uh, spacecraft, actually, that flew out to, to meet Halley's Comet. Uh, but Giotto was the, the first European deep space mission and actually got the closest and got the best stuff, uh, which were these iconic images. Uh, this one in particular, it really unlocked our understanding of the fact that there was a solid nucleus in the middle of all of this. Um, that there was activity based on where the sun was pointing at the surface, and that the, uh, the nucleus was rather dark. This is actually a false colour image, which apparently, so rumour has it, is the reason why Margaret Thatcher stopped funding uh, space science, because she didn't like this image. And it's taken us quite a few years to recover from that, but I don't know if that's true. A bit before my time. Anyway... Um, as Ian pointed out, this is the original Rosetta mission. This comes from a video that you can go on YouTube. It's from the old, one of the old Horizons, uh, Horizon uh, programs. Um, again, this was the original proposal. It was shown to be a bit too extravagant. NASA pulled out. Same, same old story. We had to do things a bit less. But still, we have the, the mission we have now, which is uh, pretty good. Instead of going to a comet, taking a bit, and bring it, bring it to the laboratories we have on Earth, you do the next best thing. You take the best laboratory out to the comet itself. 
But it's actually isn't the first to go to a comet, um, as we saw with Giotto and the other fl flotilla. There's been a number of other visits. These are just some of the comets we've been to, the ones we've imaged. The key thing being that they were flybys at hundreds of kilometres distance and at very high velocities, relative velocity to the comet. So you just got a snapshot at tens of kilometres, 80 kilometres a second. Really was just bang, a moment in time that you were seeing this comet. The key thing with Rosetta is that we're getting very, very close to the comet and we remain with it at walking pace for over a year. That's the key thing. So we are observing how the comet works. Why is it named? I think we've already covered this, that basically it's this uh, connection with comets, the fact that they are these building blocks of the solar system. They're, they're the leftover debris of how the solar system began. By looking at them, we will unlock where we came from, where the, how the solar system evolved to the situation we have today. And so I'm making that comparison with unlocking the ancient language of the Egyptians. Rosetta itself is quite a big spacecraft. It's about 32 metres across, which is the size of a basketball court. Uh, I think that works out to be 1.5 chains, which means it's about one and a half times as long as a cricket pitch, if you have that kind of language. Uh, <coughs> the uh, fillet lander, about 100 kilos, size of a large washing machine. At launch, all of this was about three tonnes. It now weighs much less than that, about 40% left, because all of it was fuel to get to where it had to go. The <coughs> instrumentation that I was alluding to before, we've got a good set of instruments things that will look remotely, things that sniff and taste what's coming at them in the, the coma of the comet. And with Philae, you actually have the best thing, uh, the best set of instruments that you would want if you were going to go and actually touch and scratch and sniff the comet. Here's an image I found of uh, the Ptolemy uh, team with Colin there. This was when they uh, delivered the, uh, the flight model. So they're quite happy. Actually, I'm using this uh, cartoon. So I actually got this from Colin uh, from a talk that he gave a year or so ago. This is the target comet, Churumov Gerasimenko, or, you know, yes, it could have been Smith or Jones. Um, this is what we thought it looked like even this time last year. We thought it looked like a, a big grey splodgy potato about four kilometres across. Um, it's got an orbit that goes just outside of Jupiter. It's a Jupiter-class comet. It takes about six or so years. We chose this one. Uh, because you have to have some kind of predictability in comets, so we choose a periodic comet, that's the one we went to. It's difficult to get to though, so we had to launch in 2004 and chase down the comet. We did that by doing a number of flybys, even though we had three tons of spacecraft, we had to get that off the ground, that's not enough fuel to get you out to the orbit of the comet. We had to use the gravity of the Earth and, the, and Mars, doing these swing bias to get us out to, to the right radius, the, the right orbit to catch up with the comet. On the way, we could do fun stuff like a selfie. This is actually um, from the, the images on the Philae lander, so on the papoose kind of uh, view, looking down the solar panel and looking at Mars. We were also doing a lot of science in these flybys as well. We also went past a couple of asteroids, uh, Lutetia and Steins, is uh, some, some plasma information that we gained, so the interaction between Mars and the outer atmosphere of the Sun. We did a similar investigation flying past the Earth as well. We had several uh, fly paths, and then eventually we got so far out away from the Sun that there wasn't enough power to power most of the components on board, so we put the spacecraft into hibernation in June 2011. Just as we were doing that, we rotated the spacecraft to point towards where we were going, where the target comet was. So these are the, the cameras on board the spacecraft, Osiris, and in there somewhere is the comet. So we were kind of looking at where we were going. Then jump forward a couple of years to January last year, and we were all very apprehensive as to whether we would have a mission, because we knew nothing about the spacecraft at this time. The spacecraft was programmed to come out of hibernation automatically by itself. We had no control. We didn't know whether it was there, where we were looking, whether it would come back. But we saw this little thing here, and uh, contrary to certain people on Newsnight, this wasn't a setup. This is actually very a nervous period, because there are a lot of people who invested a lot of time and their lives in, to get to this uh, stage, and we had a mission. And there's the celebrations at OU uh, when we knew that we actually had a mission. We were on our way to the comet. Quite quickly after that, we went from the grey potato. No, it's not that. <coughs> it looks more like this, this, this black duck, and here's a, a scale for you. It's still the, 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 the predictions that we had based on Hubble, this grey potato, uh, were quite good in science and size, but we never thought we'd get such a fantastic object like this. 
This is, this, this is a summary slide of all the science that we've picked up thus far, kind of the, the, the first, um, the baseline of what we believe the, the comet represents at the moment in terms of what its mass is, uh, what its volume is, the kind of reflective surface. A number of the images that you see are quite grey-like, but actually the surface is very, very dark. It's, it has an albedo somewhere, it says you, uh, tells you here, it's about 5 or 4%, which is much darker than Ashfeld. So it's a very dark object, it doesn't reflect much light which means it's, very, it's got a lot of organic material in it. There's also ice sublimating and forming a coma, and we're observing that already and, and, and kicking off. Going back to the mass, um, its density is something akin to cork or styrofoam. The gravity, if you were on the surface, if you can jump four centimetres on Earth, you'd be able to lift off and never come back to it, so it's quite a low-gravity environment. Uh, so I think most of us in the room can do that. Um, which means it's a very alien environment, and that's the thing. You can make, a, you, you can kind of collect to um, terrestrial analogues, but sometimes that just doesn't work. Here's a, a recent map that's been made. These are basically morphological maps saying, well, this, this region has these kind of key features, and that's how you de delineate between these units. There is a naming theme, again, following the, uh, the e Egyptology. I think I'll, I'll skip on quickly here. And we still keep this, so here's the Imhotep region, this is actually at the base of the duck. Um, we're naming things on the smaller scale as well, so you have this large scale uh, presence of the comet, but we can look at smaller scales. So this is the Cheops boulder, this thing here, it's about 40 metres high, named after the, I think it's the, the Giza um, necropolis in, uh, in Egypt, and the, the Grand Pyramid of Giza, and here it is for scale. This is an image that gets the conspiracy theorist people going. Um, <laughs> So we were doing science, we've done a lot of science with the mission, but this, this run-up last year as we got the rendezvous, you know, we, we captured the comet as it were and started to ride alongside it from August last year, we had a very important task to do as well, and that was a priority task, and that was to sit in rooms with funny glasses on trying to work out where to land on this bloody thing. Because it was such a weird shape, it had such diverse terrain, it was a great comet, but that also means, scientifically, that also mean, meant it was a challenge um, operationally to try and find somewhere to land. Ultimately, though, through our 3D glasses, and I thought this was a gimmick, to be honest with you, you think, oh, what do you need these for? It really works. You really need that to bring these 2D shapes into 3D to get an idea of the fact that you're looking down a 900-metre cliff, so that's not a good place to land. And I suffer from vertigo, so I didn't tend to want to put them glasses on much. Uh, in the end, we went for Site J or Gilkia, which is just on the kind of the edge of this uh, crater region, the big crater on the head of the comet. This time, as we were approaching, we were doing more selfies. Um, there's this common phrase of having a duck face when you do a selfie. We didn't see a duck face at Mars, but technically, if this is our duck, there is its face, so that is a selfie with a duck face. Uh, you also see that we're starting to see some emission of gas and dust from the, the neck region here. What followed was uh, a massively intense amount of uh, operations and preparations to deploy the lander. We went out to about 23 kilometres. That's where it was decided would be the best place to deploy the lander there uh, to get to its target point. It was not a relaxed couple of days around that time. This is a picture I took from, you may be familiar from the images, this is the main control room in ESOC. There are some famous faces there. There's Andrea scratching his head, looking worried. This is the back of Fred Janssen's head. This is the night before, yeah, it's about five to nine when we were discussing there were some issues with the lander. How will we go through the procedural, um, the, the, the steps for a go rather than no go? And after about two hours, we had a procedure that was written on this board, which is actually a scanner. It's quite fun. You press a button and the whole board goes behind and then you get a PDF of it. So you have people signing a white board to say, this is the procedures we will run to make a go requirement. That go went ahead at about three o'clock in the morning. I'd gone to the pub with Fred to have a couple of gin and tonics. And uh, at 12 o'clock, we said, look, let's just go to bed. I'll t we'll get a text when things are right. A slight ping at three o'clock in the morning, everything was go. Fast forward a couple of hours, we got this fantastic image. This meant that the lander had deployed, it had started that journey towards the surface. So we have the Shiva imager on board the uh, fillet looking back at Rosetta. It's a slight blur because the uh, lander was rotating. Uh, then we have, a, there's a number of iconic images that you've probably seen already, but I have to show them. 
This was a nice one as well, the fact that we saw that the land and legs had deployed. It looks rather cat-like, which gives you some confidence because cats are quite good at landing. But now we get to that part of the story. This is the rollless camera from the bottom of the lander looking down from about 40 metres. This boulder or block is about uh, four or so metres across. Then this is the first image from the surface of the comet. This is from the Shiva camera. It went a bit wrong. There was something wrong here. Now we got that afterwards. Now we look back and go, ah, we know why this looks so weird. It's because we didn't just land, we bounced. This is, can be seen in a before, before and after image. Hopefully this doesn't set everyone off into fits. But what you can see is from the navigation camera, there's a dark patch here. So this is before, after, before, after, before, after. That's the landing spot. And then just there is the lander and the shadow below it as well. So it's basically bounced and gone to here that we've captured in two subsequent navigation camera images. In a more detailed view, you can see here, this is, this is the lander approaching its touchdown here and then subsequently goes over here because it had a little bounce. This is the image in this square before, and this is the image after. You see these three points, uh, which we're still trying to analyze because it's a little bit bigger than the lander. So we're trying to work out, this is still ongoing, how, um, how the lander did its little jaunt across the surface of the comet. That's the noise from the acoustic sensors on the feet of the lander for the first impact, which have given us some valuable measurements of, of, of the nature of the surface. Ptolemy, the, image, uh, the instrument that Ian was uh, presenting earlier on, has made some fantastic measurements because not only did we stay in one place, we had a couple of, a couple of other landings. And this is this, this, these are some magnetic field measurements. When you hit something with um, a lot of components and a magnetometer on it, it perturbs the whole system and you can generate magnetic fields. So what you can do through the magnetometer is actually detect when you hit the surface. You can also use radio signals and we see that we, went, we hit things about three times. There was a little clip of a boulder or a cliff and the timing of this was such that we think we've just seen the lander going over the edge uh, of the big B uh, crate, landing site crater, that crater on, on the head. But the key thing being, we, we went down three times, but at least Ptolemy, and, and, and boy, you can see the magnetometer here, is on most of the time seeing and measuring as it goes across the face of the comet. Ptolemy's got measurements from two places at least, uh, which, is, which is more than we bargained for. This glass is half full all the time for me. Then we you know, ended up in this ditch. Um, you can pick that out because, well, you can see a bit of sky here. This doesn't come out too well, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up in a second. Uh, by looking at this image here and this image here. Using this imagery, we are, or the uh, colleagues in uh, Flight Dynamics down in Toulouse have kind of worked out the local to topography and where we must be oriented. So we're really getting to somewhere we never would have dreamt of getting. We've, we're peering into the past. Uh, Jean-Pierre Biebring, the PI of this, uh, in, this uh, instrument, sometimes does a, a little graphic here where he'll point at this saying this is 20 years old and that this is 4.6 billion years old. It's a nice contrast. And the fact that you have this man-made object with such an ancient alien body in the background. This is the other image pointing up. We've got space here, but this is the cliff that's uh, overhanging. And these bright spots are actually the sun glinting off of the surface of the uh, lander and, and uh, beaming onto the... So, so we're really impacting this thing, so which is nice. Uh, right, so we have the target point. We actually got within about 120 metres of it from 23 kilometres, which is pretty good shooting. Uh, the lander just didn't like being there. It wanted to come over here instead. <coughs> a couple of comments on um, outreach, which is something that Colin certainly was uh, very good at and knew how to, to put the story out there. There are a number of colleagues here from Open University. Uh, something that we've managed to do um, with that kind of effort through, through everyone, people like Colin being able to get out there and tell the story of science, why it's important, and colleagues here uh, from, from Open University. Uh, this little chart I put down here is basically people were asked after the landing if they knew what Rosetta was, what Philae was, and these percentages are people answering correctly. Unfortunately, the UK is the lowest out of these countries, <laughs> but still, uh, I think it was a good job. Uh, certainly, there was a, there was a, uh, a presentation uh, or, or a stand at the Royal Society last year that was led by Open University. Natalie Starkey was actually very um, a key figure in getting that going. There's Ian with hair. Um, and I had my part, and it's part of my job to go around and tell people about the mission, as I'm doing here. And I was invited to Stratford-upon-Avon Amateur Astronomy Society. And 
had a very nice talk, very nice interactions with, with the gang there. And then I met this guy, Andrew Baxter. Uh, we are fr you know, friends because we have beards. Uh, and the, he bought me a pint and he said, you know, I knew, I knew Colin when I was in university, so you can pick out Colin here. And he sent me this picture that I forwarded onto Judith. And there's Colin in his younger years from uh, the University of Swansea at the time. But basically that you meet people who, who knew Colin and have very nice anecdotes about him and, and the work that he's done. And he made these kind of things possible that we're hearing about now. Right, just quickly, because I'm running out of time, where are we now? Very recently, on Valentine's Day, we did a closest approach. We've got to a stage where the outgassing of the comet is so high that it's... Uh, defeating the gravitational attraction tra between the spacecraft and, uh, and the comet. So we start doing some more strange uh, oriented trajectories. <clears throat> so that we do a close approach about six kilometers over the surface of the comet. This is to give you an idea of the field of view of this image. And you see this little wobble is actually a raster of the camera, which you make up out of these four images to give you again, this is that same belly region uh, with the Cheops boulder, I think is actually up here a bit more. Tomorrow, there will be a release of an image from down here uh, from the Osiris science camera. And it will be about 20, 220 metres across. It's a full frame image. And you'll see the Rosetta shadow on the surface of the comet, which is pretty cool. So I shouldn't have told you, but I have. There you go. You'll see it tomorrow. <laughs> I, wanted, I really wanted to show it today, but I can't because it's still under embargo. It's still being tweaked. Um, but yeah, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. I've just described it for you. And, as Ian was showing earlier, we're now going further out and we're seeing a lot of activity um, already. These boulders, some of them are up to about two metres in size that are from the previous apparition, actually. They're still hanging around. But we're safe because we're at walking pace. We should be OK. And what are we doing in the next uh, year? We go through perihelion, the closest approach to the sun in August, and then subsequently go back out away from the sun. So we, we have this ride along, seeing how the comet evolves, become maximum activity around uh, perihelion, and then die off again. And we'll see all of that. We'll get an idea of how the comet works. That's the key thing. And all of those uh, observations will give us insight into any other cometary observations and make that connection, make that insight into solar system evolution, where we came from, where the water came from from Earth, and why we're here fundamentally. So I'll summarise that here by saying it's the first, Rosetta's the first mission to shadow a comet, to uh, travelling at this walking pace, as I've been talking about. It's the first time we've delivered something to a comet surface like this. Uh, and it has and, or, and will give us the most information ever on a comet during its closest approach to the sun. I think it's also captured the imagination of millions and possibly, as Colin did, inspire many future scientists and engineers to go into this area and, and, and carry us off of the planet out into the universe. As we all look up, we can start going there as well. And I'll leave you with this slide that tells you where to follow us, uh, with a nice cartoon from, uh, from a, a book that uh, Colin put together with these key dates. And with that, I will st stop talking. Thank you very much.